you are here for our second masterclass presentation of 2022. Tonight, our masterclass is entitled The Power of Executive Presence. And I have, I've talked a little bit about our presenter earlier, Professor Todd Salovey, and I will introduce him a little bit at, in a few more minutes. I just want to introduce uh, a couple of the Rady folks so you know who to contact. And that would be um, myself. My name is Christina Cook. I am um, the Assistant Director of Admissions and Recruitment here at Rady, and I work mainly with the Flex MBA students. Um, and my colleague, Gerard Bernalis, he is my counterpart. He too is an Assistant Director of Admissions and Recruitment, and he works primarily with the full-time students. Um, please note our email addresses because we are the people you want to contact if you have questions. Um, and if you forget, you can always contact someone at the Rady Grad Admissions UCSD.edu site. Before we get started, I have a couple housekeeping items. Number one, this class is scheduled to last 45 minutes, but um, I think uh, Professor Salovey has, has noted he's able to stay for a few more minutes if the questions are, are requiring that. Um, and then this is an interactive session, so be prepared to play. We did send you a document to your emails um, that you registered with. And um, if you have not had a chance to open that document, download it and print it, you can do so now, or we have it up in the chat as well. We, this will be useful to you and somewhat necessary to get the full experience of tonight's class. Questions can be submitted in the chat at any time. Um, Gerard and I will try to answer them if we can. Um, and if they are directed to uh, Mr. Salovey, then we will have those at the end. Um, you will definitely have time to, to answer those questions. And again, if you want to schedule a personal advising session, just plug in this here. You can reach me. I'm the Flex person, and you can reach Gerard here at these email addresses. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Rady, uh, the Rady School's mission. I do this before every class. Um, the Rady Graduate School's mission um, of management advances business by generating meaningful research and educating principled, innovative leaders. So. Every MBA program is going to you know, craft you into a leader, but at Rady, we're going to craft you into principal leaders who are really looking to better our society with innovation. Some upcoming deadlines just to keep you on your toes. The full-time uh, MBA program has three more deadlines. Please note them. The final is June 1st, and the Flex MBA program had a deadline today. Ding, ding. And the final is July 1st, which is, is something you probably want to do before July 1st, but it's there. Um, you can find out more about us at our website, rady.ucsd.edu. And finally, the, the guest of honor, uh, Professor Todd Salovey. Um, he has been part of the Rady faculty for over 12 years. Uh, more importantly, though, he's been a faculty at the UC San Diego theater and dance program for over 31 years. And that program, the graduate program is actually ranked number three in the nation. He's the founding artistic director for the Lipinski Family San Diego Jewish Arts Festival. And he's been doing that for 28 years strong. And he's the associate artistic director of the San Diego Repertory Theater. So that's a long career in managing and directing it at two very prominent um, places within San Diego. As you can see, he is also very well educated with a BA from Stanford and a Master's of Fine Arts from UC San Diego. Um, and there's a couple of items I want to talk about that he's not going to tell you, but I guarantee you're not going to find it in another MBA program. So, so he has written and directed many acclaimed shows at the San Diego Rep, as well as UCSD, and within theaters in LA, Denver, and Houston. Um, one play that was um, presented at the Rep that he wrote and directed, which was called Blessings of a Broken Heart, it received the Edgerton, Edgerton New American Play Award. And this award provides funds for new plays to continue to have subsequent uh, performances. Many of the recipients of these go on to win Tony Awards, Pulitzer Prizes, and make it to Broadway. One awarded play, you know, the similar award from the Edgerton, uh, the Edgerton, I'm sorry, Edgerton, Edgerton um, Foundation was awarded to a play you might recognize as on Broadway called Hamilton. So um, yes, Professor Salovey is up there with Lynn Manuel Miranda, but there's a little bit of a difference, as you probably have guessed. Um, Mr. Miranda does not teach at the Rady MBA program. So with that, I'm going to leave it up to him to take over. Thank you for joining us. Okay, I'm gonna stop my sharing. There we go. 
Well, thanks so much. Thank you for the introduction, Christine. I'm really honored to be here. Uh, as you're choosing your MBA program, I want to give you a sample of what you might get if you take my class at Rady. But uh, also, I hope to give you some information that will help you to have executive presence and be strong in all your interviews and all your communications. I'm a theater director. And for the last 15 years, I've taken skills and techniques from the theater and used them to help leaders in all fields be stronger in their communications. I see you as current and future leaders who are going to make huge differences in a lot of different fields through your communications. And today what I want to do is quickly give you some techniques from the theater that you can use to be stronger in all your communications. I want to start with a quote that's at the top of page one at the handouts. Handouts are in the chat. If you can have them in a form that you can see them as I, as I speak with you and uh, possibly even that you can write on, I think they'd be really helpful. And then you can also use them after the workshop uh, as a guide for, for some of your communications. So I'll also do a screen share. And I wonder if someone would volunteer to read the quote at the very top of page one. Can I get a volunteer, please? Yeah, I can read it. Thank you. Um, it says, people make commitments to causes they value and to people they respect and trust. Rediscovering an authentic voice and maintaining a commitment to meaningful change are requisites for any leader who would respond to these needs. Such authenticity requires speaking from both the mind and heart directly to the minds and hearts of others. When those who listen sense both competence and conviction, they're willing to engage, to consider their own commitment, and eventually to act. Thank Very you so cute. much. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, so that's from uh, Leading Out Loud. Uh, I wonder if there's anything that resonates strongly for anyone uh, here in the Zoom. Anyway, anything in that quote resonate for you most strongly? Anyone? Okay. There's got to be someone out there. I can see your faces. I know you're there. Come on, Brian. <laughs> I can see you sitting back. I think the one thing that resonates to me is maintaining commitment. Thank you. You know, well, something yeah. that, that I often think about in that quote is the idea of coming from your mind and heart and engaging the minds and hearts of others. You know, for me in the in the theater, I was used to speaking from the heart to the heart. If I could get a donor to cry, I'd get a big donation. But I came to Rady and a lot of my students come from sciences and technical fields and are used to speaking from the mind to the mind. And I think it's a powerful idea and uh, and very central to my work to try to engage the emotions and the minds of the of the audience. So I wonder if you can put in the chat, think about who are the great presenters that you've seen. They can be people you've seen in the media, public figures, maybe people that you've worked with, people who've been teachers of yours. Could you write who they are and what makes them particularly strong? Can you write that in the chat? Who are the great presenters you've seen and what makes them really amazing? President Obama, Steve Jobs, awesome. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you, Carol. Others? Carl Sagan, so interesting. Great. Max Levchen. So many interest, so many interesting ones. I'm actually reading one of Brene Brown's books right now. Would someone would someone speak out to us one thing that makes one of these people a great speaker? I know you may not have been prepared to be so public today, but I just want to invite you to share an idea. I, I can share. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think great speakers tend to be charismatic and often inspirational and uh, make it easy to uh, for an audience that maybe is not familiar with that field to uh, 
find a message or understand a message that they're trying to convey. Uh, Tyler, Cheryl, I love what you're saying. So this idea of inspiring people and also taking complicated ideas and being able to convey them to people that may be in different fields. Danae, did you have an idea? I did. It, it kind of um, goes nicely with what Taylor was saying, and that's just that they um, can speak about things in a, in a humanizing manner. So um, making things that are complex still relatable and making you feel kind of aligned with what they're talking about and, and excited about their journey. Uh, I love the idea of humanizing. Um, I see that Natalie in chat in the chat says it feels like they're speaking directly and personally to you. Isn't it interesting that a lot of these qualities that make someone great speakers, they're they're not about what they're saying as much as how they're saying it and the way they're engaging the audience. So that's what a lot of my work is in helping you, yes, to structure material and to be clear and uh, to be dramatic in the way that you express yourself and especially to be authentic, but also to find ways to engage the audience with your passion, with your commitment, with your humanity and with your emotions. If I uh, go a little further, what I'm going to work on today is some techniques. I really want to give you value quickly today. So I'm going to work on presence, uh, authenticity, winning the first 60 seconds, starting with what matters with your values, and something that I call the four C's. So for I know, I know that uh, many of you will be doing interviews for MBA programs, and they'll be on Zoom. So I want to share some ideas, first of all, about presence and success on Zoom. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is framing, just simply where you are in your frame. Uh, how you show up on the Zoom, I think, is an important choice. An idea that we have, and it comes from video, is that your eyes, ideally, are at the two-thirds level of your screen. So I'm on my screen and I'm trying to set myself up so I'm at the two-thirds level of your screen. Um, I try to have my camera positioned at eye level. Uh, I'm also looking at I'm also looking at where I'm get, getting cut off in my body, and I'm trying to cut myself off at an unnatural place so that you imagine the rest of the area beneath my body. So framing is a really important part of setting yourself off to be present and have commanding presence when you're on Zoom. Another idea that maybe you haven't thought a lot about is lighting. Uh, for me, uh, I like to think, of course, of lighting is in front, and the best kind of lighting that you can use is sunlight. But when you're not speaking from sunlight, what I do is actually I put a light 45 degrees to my right and another light 45 degrees to my left so that I'm actually casting some shadows so you get a sense of texturing on my face. Okay, here's a big idea. And this idea is, and again, this is all in the notes on top of page two, uh, is engaging your camera. So I know it's tempting, and I would love to do this, is just look at your pictures. Um, and sometimes, you know, you have to look at people in order to connect, to feel like you're with people. But try to treat your camera as one of the people who's also in your Zoom. So you see, if I'm looking at the lowest level of my Zoom, then you don't really see my eyes. But if I treat the camera as one of the people that I'm speaking to, then you get a better sense of my presence. Again, executive presence here on Zoom. Another, another hack that I use is to take someone that I'm speaking to and I move them in the Zoom underneath my camera so that I can look at Jared and look at my camera back and forth very easily. A physical idea that I like to think about is an idea of being open and forward. So I want my energy towards the camera, towards you, to be open. Anything that I'm doing to hide myself and block myself off from you is giving you less value from me. So for example, if I'm folding my hands, if my hands are up here, but particularly if I'm reading something, and I know we all read off the screen, I'm not giving you I'm not giving you full value. So try to find parts of any communication where you're open and forward and fully engaging the camera. I call that 
why not take all of me? There's a song, why not take all of me? Anything I'm doing that keeps you from experiencing all of me is not giving you full value and uh, not giving me a chance to be full present. So open and forward, why not take all of me? Engage the camera, strong light from the front and framing yourself in the frame. Just some specific things to think about so that you're coming across really well. I'm an acting teacher and I always start a workshop in my class with a, with a short acting war, warm up and you'll have to be, you'll have to forgive me for this. It may be a little out of your comfort zone, but can you put your hand on your belly and just breathe in and out and in and out and in and out. Great. And now can you breathe in? and out on a hum mm. and again out on a hum mm. and one more and a hum mm. and now a lip flutter like this can you do that and again great i want to ask if someone here will share a story with us so i'm going to move into the idea of the power of stories and sharing authenticity and I know that this is asking a lot in a workshop where we don't know each other and you just got into the work and you just got into the workshop. But this is going to be a mixture of giving content and actually having some people do some short presentation. So on the middle of page two, I have a choice for you of four possible stories. Story number one is your most meaningful moment at school or work. Do you have an experience at school or work that was really meaningful for you? Number two, your hero or your mentor. Number three, a tough challenge that changed you. Hopefully that won't be your application to rating. A tough challenge that changed you. And four, your most embarrassing moment. So that's a choice. Can you think of one uh, of those and a story that you have for one of those. I'd like you just to think about, you don't have to plan out the whole story or even script the whole story, but I want you to just think about the beginning, middle and end of the story. So if that's a structure, just think about the beginning, the middle of it and the end. And I'll give you, I'll give you 45 seconds to think about it. Again, you don't have to plan it out too carefully. Okay, awesome. I do this with so much trepidation, but please, <laughs> would someone volunteer to share one of their four stories, either your most meaningful moment at work, your hero, a tough challenge that changed you, or your most embarrassing moment? Let me open the floor for someone to share a story with us. Yeah, I like to volunteer, sir. Thank you so much, Keith. No worries. So um, I used to work for an armor truck company called Brinks. And I had uh, progressed very well uh, from a starting position and eventually ended up into a minor leadership role while I was working with the company. Um, fairly early on into my career with them as a leader, there was a day when most of the management team, team was either on vacation or at a convention and it really fell down on me. Um, so one day in particular, I was all by myself. Things were going smooth until it did not had several sick calls. Um, we had people running late. And, and when the, the, the moment everything broke down, the part that really broke me was that one of our trucks broke down in the middle of the 805 and rush hour traffic. Uh, I had a mental block and I had only one other person there to really assist me during this time. And he, he stood back for a moment. He saw that look in my face, uh, the freeze. And he, he, he said, Keith, calm down. Um, let me help you work out through this. And he started to make some calls. We called the police to try and assist us. And he started to really take the tasks, to the, the, the things we needed to do to de-escalate the situation one by one to figure out the solution and how we could un, uh, get us out of this mess. 
And I really cherished that moment. It really changed me because I, I the mental block had, had, had just stopped me from really solving the situation. And the way he was able to um, deescalate the task and find many solutions to the problems we were experiencing really changed the way I would think about challenges that I would eventually face later on in my life. Uh, let's give Keith a round of applause for sharing that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. So let me ask you a question. How do you listen when someone shares an authentic story? How do you listen to it? I don't want to share how you, what you were thinking about or doing as you listened. I will. I think I um, kind of put myself in their situation and uh, start just feeling empathy for them and um, thinking, gosh, I don't know what I would do. Gosh, what's he going to do? Um, so I'm kind of right there in the moment with him. It's so interesting, don't we listen in such a such a giving way in a generous way when someone shares authenticity with us. Um, this idea of creating empathy that the Danae is talking about when someone is sharing an authentic story. Um, I think that there are so many opportunities we have to share meaningful stories as part of our leadership. And as you're applying to an MBA program, I think it'd be interesting to think about these stories that would express who you are and what you value and what you've learned from. Um, the other thing I love about the story that Keith is telling is that it's so authentic. And it's such a quick way of my feeling like I have trust with Keith because Keith is sharing an authentic story with me. So thank you so much for demonstrating that. I think that we have so many opportunities in our leadership to share authentic stories. I wanna to move to the next topic and move very quickly through a few things here. And it's an idea called winning the first 60 seconds. Um, I have a quote you can see on page two, and that comes from a, uh, a social scientist Nalini Ambadi, who has a study called Thin Slices that body language and facial gesture provide sufficient visual information to support high level social inferences from thin slices of behavior. Given short movies of nonverbal behavior, adults make reliable judgments in a large number of tasks. We decode the social world with relative ease and automaticity making rich social inferences from sparse, thin slices of behavior. So I think about this idea that when I'm presenting myself in an interview, in a class, that my audience is making judgments in very short periods of time that are, that are very meaningful. This also comes to me from the world of theater. When actors audition, an audition for a role is usually about 10 minutes but they say that auditions are decided in the first 60 seconds. Actors hate hearing that because it actually feels like I haven't even got to my high notes yet. You've already judged, but I've seen about 10,000 auditions. I was a casting, a casting director. And in fact, auditions are not decided in the first 60 seconds. They're often decided when the actor walks in the door. So what am I what am I noticing? What am I deciding in 60 seconds in a blink, right? To quote Malcolm Gladwell. So I decide what I've thought about is that we're actually noticing two key relationships and a focus. I'm noticing right away what the actor thinks about themselves, what value they feel they bring into the room. I'm I'm noticing what they think about me and what relationship they're inviting me into. And then I'm noticing, what do they want to have happen? What's their objective? So just to illustrate this, in acting, you generally audition about 20 times for every role that you get cast. So most actors come in, what they think about themselves is, oh, this is so humiliating. And what they think about me is you're gonna reject me. And their objective is to get out of the room with their dignity intact. So of course they don't win the first 60 seconds. But the other kind of actor, someone who walks in and they're going, 
I'm the greatest actor on the West Coast. By the way, I think two days ago, I actually auditioned the greatest actor on the West Coast. But anyway, the greatest actor on the West Coast, <laughs> and they're thinking about me is, you're going to love me. And their objective is to get the lead in the show. I actually don't respond that well to that either. What I respond to is someone who walks in. Think about this in terms of your interviews for MBA programs. I'm thinking about someone who walks into the audition and what they're thinking is, I love acting. I love a great part. I'm looking for something juicy to sink my teeth into. What do they think about me? They think about me as you're a director whose work interests me. You're someone who I would be interested in collaborating with. And what do they want to make happen? They want to have a meaningful, authentic time in the room with me to see if we want to work together. When I meet someone like that, I just want to keep them in the room for so much more than the 10 minutes of the audition. And I want to work with them, not just in that play, but for years to come. So I, I like to think about in any presentation, what's the relationship? I'm trying to create. So I wanna, I wanna walk you through this in this workshop form. If you go to the bottom of page three, I want you to think about a presentation or an interview that you might have to make coming in the future. So what's a meaningful presentation or an interview that you have upcoming? Give it a title. So maybe call it, call that uh, Rady interview. And you can use all my Zoom techniques while you, uh, when you have that radio interview. Okay. Can you give me a wave or a nod if you've thought of the, you've thought of the title of that presentation? Do you need a little more time? So what I want you to think about in preparation for a presentation of walking in the room and winning the first 60 seconds, is what's your relationship to yourself? What value do you think you brought in the room, you bring in the room? Why do you deserve to be there? What do you care about? What do you value? I think even if you just write what you care about, you know, I'm looking for a, I'm looking, I'm looking for a place where I can really grow and challenge myself. What do you care about? If I'm talking to a donor, I might be thinking, I really want to strengthen our community through great art. And then on page four, that idea of What's your relationship to your audience? What do they value? What, what do you have in common with them? What do they offer? What do you admire about them? Gosh, just thinking about that in terms of my audience, if I'm thinking about an MBA interview, just thinking about that, you know, that, you know, you're someone who's, who's, who's looking for people that are great fit for the program. You're someone who has wisdom about how I can meaningfully spend the next two or three years. Or there's so many things that you can, uh, you know, that you can think about the other person as opposed to that you're judging me, right? And then what's your objective? What, what do you want? What do you want the audience to do? What do you want the person talking to do? Obviously, you want them to look you in the eye and say, right, that like, you're a perfect fit for this. Or maybe you want them to, to actually advise you about whether you are a perfect fit for this. Or maybe you want them to recommend to you where you'd be a perfect fit for, what the next step should be. So for me, just thinking about those things, who I am, what, what I value, what I have to offer, who are you, what do you value? What do you have to offer? Sometimes I think about what excellence can I bring out to you, in you? And what's my objective? What do I, what do I want to make happen? So again, those are, if you've ever taken acting to me, those are the given circumstances that you go in before your entrance to play your scene thinking about. What I find is that audiences, 
if you embody a certain relationship, like that the audiences will often join you in that relationship. So if I treat you like partners, you'll enter into that relationship with me. So what I then do is I take that work and I make an opening script out of it. We don't really have time to do this, but I, uh, but, but if you've got the handouts, it may be something that you, that you work on, uh, uh, after the workshop, I change that to a six, uh, like a 40 to 60 second opening, which is basically who I am, who you are, and what I want to do together. And so I started today. Uh, well, let me go a little bit further into that. When I say who, you, who are you, I don't want to give my whole bio. And I also don't want to tell you something you already know. Often I want to share a value. Who you are, again, I don't want to tell you something you know. I want to maybe share something I admire about you. And what I want to do together, something that maybe invites you to join me in this conversation. So I'll give you, an, I'll give you a sense of how this might work because I started today with this opening. I said, I'm a theater director and I've spent the last 12 years taking techniques from theater to help people be stronger and all the help leaders be stronger in all their communications. Okay, that's who I am. Who are you? I see you as current and future leaders who are going to make a big difference in the world through your communications. What do I want to do together? I want to give you techniques and skills from the theater that make you stronger in all your communications. That's my start. Who am I? Who are you? What do I want to do together? I find that that template, it's a structure, can be a fantastic way of starting a presentation for you. And so I invite you to use that template and script an opening for yourself that you can use at the start of a presentation. And you know what? What a great answer to tell me about yourself. You know, that could be your answer to tell me about yourself. Um, by the way, I always say after you script something is try it out, rehearse it, come from the theater. Don't make the time that you say it in an interview the first time you say it. In my classes, I have people give each other feedback and rehearse things all the time. And this opening is something I've been working on and refining for a couple of years. So I love the process of developing something. Okay, we move to number five, page five. This is something that I absolutely love. And it's the idea, this also comes um, from Terry Pierce's Getting Things Done, which is what's the starting point of your executive presence? To me, it's what matters to you. It's what you value. I'd like to ask you in the chat, could you write three things that you that you would say are your values what are three things that are so important that you would teach them to your relatives to your friends to your children as the foundation of a happy life you'd post them at the office for your colleagues colleagues to see or you'd be willing to take a stand for them i invite you to write into the chat what are your what are your what are your three most two or three most important values to you Wonderful. Thank you, Arati, to, to be kind, respective, and humble. Thank you. Invest in yourself. Thank you, Christina. Family, commitment, integrity. Thank you, Keith. Brian, honesty, ethics, hard work. Great. Danae, integrity, diversity, family. Uh, 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 sorry, it's jumped. Authenticity, respect. Danae, I see you embody those. Jared, integrity, empathy, work ethic, integrity, diversity, family, loyalty, respect, dedication, respect, understand, honor, integrity, loyalty, caring, integrity, honesty, commitment, passion, family, fearlessness, honesty, and commitment, integrity, passion, respect, integrity, commitment, authenticity, honest, humble, creative, passion, kind, humility. Well, let me just tell you with those values, you'll find a great home at Rady. I think at Rady, these are values that we really respect, nurture, and honor. So <clears throat> what I find extraordinary to think about in terms of values is that our values are often based on our own personal experiences. So what I would ask you to think about is, is there 
Pick one of your values. Is there an experience that you've had that made it clear to you that that chosen value is important? Pick one of your values and think about an experience that you had that showed you one of those values was super important. Okay, again, I, I, I ask you to take a huge risk with me. And would someone share their story of the what happened to make you see that that value is important? I invite someone to, to volunteer. So um, this is Brian. Thank you. Uh, recently at work, I worked directly for um, the senior leadership team, and there was a um, a reorg that recently happened. And uh, I do a report for the president, and he gives it to the owner of the company. And uh, the new manager for me decided they wanted to see that report before the vice president of the company had a chance to look at all the inputs that I collect for them. And um, I felt that that was an ethical violation because it was uh, taking information that was not theirs before the vice president had a chance to approve it. And uh, in the end, um, I'm getting a promotion for it. So <clears throat> it's um, I, I saw that there was a problem and I raised a flag and uh, I did it in a polite way. Thank you, Brian. Again, uh, I give you a round of applause for sharing that story with us. Again, look at the power of authenticity, the power of someone sharing an authentic story. Again, why is that powerful? Because I think there's a sense of stakes in it because it's very authentic and because it's not scripted. It's something that's being created for us right now, right in this moment. So we listen to it in a certain way. And frankly, it's also really inspiring to hear. I think also that idea of leading with your values and a story of your values is also a great start to a tell me about yourself question that might come in an interview. You know, so think about this, you know, someone says to you, tell me about yourself and you say, well, you know, I've been working in the theater. I've been working in the theater. I have a bachelor's from Stanford. I went to UCSD. That's not nearly as interesting as someone saying, like, um, I really, I, I think that creativity and communal experiences in the theater can heal people in a different time and then I, in a difficult time. And then I tell a story about what just happened to me directing a company together in a play while we were being tested three times a week for COVID and just feeling that we created a community of a piece that could heal people to bring to the public. That's so much more interesting than my sharing something that's right on my resume and that someone probably has already read. Um, although, to be honest, I have to say one of the things I teach is that facts are super important. And so when you're communicating, possibly the most powerful thing you can do is to have one, two, three of really persuasive facts that you can speak about very clearly and passionately that make your case. Um, on page six, I want to give you something I call the four C's. People ask me, uh, people ask me, if you want to get better at presentations, what can you do right away to do it? And uh, if you just in case that you don't have the handouts right now, I'll um, I'll put that up for you on the on the screen share. So the three the four C's for me are to connect, to converse, to command, and to commit. And I'd like to describe each of these. So for me, the starting point of a presentation is connect to what you're talking about. Find your interest and your passion in what you're talking about and connect to your audience, especially if you're in person, to make strong eye contact. Actually look at people in the room. Be available to people. And if you're on Zoom, Connect to people through the camera. Connect to people by the generosity of why not take all of me. Converse. Um, I don't think people like speeches. I Even if I'm speaking, I want the audience to know that I want to hear what you have to say. 
So every presentation, make it feel not like a speech, make it feel like an invitation to be part of a conversation. Command, C to me, command is a few things. If you're in person, command to me means shoulders back, lead from the heart, and use enough sound to fill the room. What's interesting is if you use enough volume, volume is, uh, is interpreted as confidence and confidence is interpreted as competence. So I've been speaking loud and people think I know what I'm talking about. So shoulders back, lead from the heart, fill the room with sound. Now, everything that I was talking about in the opening of the presentation, good lighting, good framing, engaging your camera, why not take all of me? Those are all, all command, command uh, ideas. Commit, what you're talking about, commit to it right now. Don't, don't speak about sort of, don't say it's like, don't have a bunch of ums and ahs. You have limited time in front of people, commit to being there, commit to the things that you're speaking about. You can practice this anytime you want. Take my four questions. What's your name? Where you're from? What values are most important to you? What scares you? And what do you want to be doing in three years? And those are all things. And you can do a practice of doing the four C's and just, uh, just, just use those four questions as a prompt. Don't write a script. Just put them up with you and practice the four C's. So uh, I want to ask you today, we ask you now, this is the end of the content that I have for today. Uh, just like any of my classes, I, I cover a lot of material in a short time. Uh, I want to ask you to feedback to me. You can put in the chat. What did you think is most valuable from the work that we did together today? What is most, uh, uh, what's your takeaway from the work that we did today? Just put, you can put that in the chat. Also to phrase that, it's what's something that, that, that you can do. Uh, what's one takeaway to make your presentations and your presence stronger? Prepare for an interview, thanks. Oh, thank you, Sergio. Speaking with passion, being authentic, thank you. Bringing our value and what you care about, thank you. Steven, taking all of you, relationship to the audience, being confident from within, fill the room with sound, thank you, Harit. Michael, be yourself and be passionate. Great, Jared, I'm glad you appreciate the printout. Thank you. So in a summary today, when you're in an interview and when you're in communication, be open and forward and think about inviting the audience to get the most value by taking all of you. Um, your sweet spot in communication are your own thoughts, your own experiences, your own stories. Your authenticity is that sweet spot. Win the first 60 seconds by inviting people to be into, in a relationship with you. Your values are the starting point of all your communications. Your values are the starting point of your executive presence. Think about them and the stories of them and live in them. And finally, remember the four C's. Connect, converse, command, and commit. Thank you so much. It was so much fun to spend 45 <laughs> minutes with you. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at Rady. And uh, I have my email at the bottom. If you have any questions for me that you want to send me over an email, I'm happy to do it. And uh, if you like, I can stay in the Zoom for, for a few minutes and answer any questions you'd like to ask. I want to thank you. Um... You know, I'm going to speak very loudly. <laughs> I want to thank you, Professor Salovey. This is really unique, and um, I appreciated it in my own personal life. And I know by definitely by the looks of all these wonderful comments that they these these folks appreciate it as well. These are lessons that are not only going to help you in your professional life, but in your personal life, really, and you know, for the for your for your days on earth. So thank you so much for coming and being with us today. It was really great. You're welcome. My pleasure. Questions? Actually, I'm going to ask you a quick question. So yeah. when, when people speak and they tell an authentic story, do people, is it because they're opening up sort of a, a vulnerable space and then people respect that? They feel like, well, they're doing that without any prompting or any questions. Therefore, I'm going to let down my guard 
and I'm gonna I'm gonna feel more comfortable with them and, and maybe share some of my stuff. I believe that that people enter into the relationship you invite them into. And and that by sharing an authentic story, you're showing me that you trust me and that you're willing to be vulnerable and authentic with me. And you're inviting me to listen to you with authenticity. You know, what's actually interesting is that I've noticed in workshops that active listening gives people permission to be authentic, that just being generous in your listening makes people feel they can share things with you. And so I think it really works both ways that bringing authenticity and generosity into your speaking and into your listening creates a culture where people trust themselves to be authentic together. God, active listening is really a gift. And so few of us really practice, you know, as much as we should. There's a technique that I use on active listening that also comes from the theater and it's an idea um, it's an idea called reflection. So what if you if you if you dare yourself to reflect back something that you just heard. So Christina talked about, yes, um, active listening is a gift and it is really difficult. The fact that I know that I'm going to reflect back something that you said to me uh, forces me to listen in a really active way. Um, and also, I think one of the big challenges that we have now is people don't feel heard. People feel invisible. I don't know if you feel that way, but I think a lot of people feel invisible. And it's such a gift and an honor that you give to people. I see with, with so many of the values that we have, they involve being generous to other people. It's a real act of generosity when you hear something somebody says and you start what you're saying by reflecting back what you heard. And the simple way to do a reflection is to say, what I, what I heard you say was this. Other questions? I have a question. Um, thank you so much. It's definitely really uh, helpful tips and lessons that I'm gonna take advantage of. But uh, one of the questions I had is just like, um, there are so many different schools out there so why Rady do you think specifically sets sets it apart from other schools? That's a great, great question. And I, I would say three things. The first is that it's an extremely collaborative environment. And that when you meet the students here, it's unbelievable. People are interested in being excellent, but they're not interested in your, your taking away their excellence. They want to do it with you. And I find that the students at Rady are tremendously collaborative and supportive, and they really help each other do so many things. A second reason is that it's a very international program, and people are just amazed at the diversity of the student body. And the fact that, I mean, you learn about other markets all over the world and other opportunities all over the world just in your cohort, um, and it's unique that way. And I think the third is just like, Graduate programs are difficult. And just just look at the the backgrounds to Christina and Gerard's uh, <laughs> um, you know, photo, uh, screens is that this is a really beautiful place. You can, uh, while, while you're taking a class at Rady in the state of the art building, you can see hang gliders uh, float by while the sun is setting. And I just think that San Diego has great restaurants has great places to hang out, and it's a great place to go to school. So those to me would be three big reasons. And I guess the fourth is, if you're interested in entrepreneurship, there's a strong focus on the kind, I think it's why I fit in well at Rady is that it's a really creative place to be. Thank you. Yeah, those are all really good reasons. I had a quick question. Absolutely. But, oh, how are you doing, Professor? Thank you. Uh... Professor Shelby for inviting me to. My name is Lou, by the way. Hi, Lou. Thank you. I, I studied actually. I'm a theater major. I studied in uh, the arts uh, as an undergraduate, so I have a little bit to relate. <laughs> so um, yeah, the question was, um, what was the question? Oh, do you teach the undergraduate students as well? Just in case I have a relative that wants to go to UCSD, um, that's the question. And the other one is, um, I was going to give a scenario um, that you brought up 
about uh, passion because, you know, I ended up auditioning for a play and as an undergraduate and I, I got to play. I got cast in the play because of my passion for the theater arts. So, you know, <laughs> I studied at Northridge. So. Well, Lou, I hope you come here because uh, I, I really enjoy when I have uh, people with acting training and acting experience in my, oh, yeah. my mm -hmm. communications classes. Um, so so you can take a uh, MBA course with me at Rady, or you can go to the theater department and you can take intro to theater with me or acting 101 with me, as well as higher level <laughs> my courses. Card, I'll let my film know. OK, so I'm definitely in, I'm definitely Great. teaching both graduates and undergraduates. Great. Yep. I'm pursuing an MBA right now. So thank you. You're welcome. So, so Brian, the best actor, um, <laughs> oh, the best actor of the West Coast. I can, I, I haven't made the offer yet. So I don't want to, but literally, I'm in the audition going like, oh my gosh, I'm so honored this person is auditioning for me for this play. But, to, but you know what's crazy is that I might not offer them the part. It's down to two people. And there's so many other things that you're thinking about. Isn't that interesting to think about that? I love them. I admire them. I'm blown away by them. I'm moved by them and I might not cast them. So I think it's really interesting why we don't prejudge a situation and assume that we didn't, we weren't impressive because we didn't get a certain opportunity. But the best actor that I know is Jefferson Mays, and Jefferson won the Tony for the play I Am My Own Wife, and Jefferson was Hamlet in My Hamlet. Carol, do you know Jefferson Mays? Yes. <laughs> Jefferson is Love the it. riskiest yeah. and most versatile actor I've ever met. Yeah, I, I've been in, you know, in past years when it was pre-COVID, I've been lucky enough to go see theater in London and in New York and other places. So I, I love it. Um, I haven't been able to do it lately, um, but um, it is uh, it's something I really love to do with my with my family. We all we all enjoy it a lot. Jefferson was in uh, A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder as well as uh, I'm My Own Wife. He's okay. actually on Broadway right now in Music Man. People are going like, I didn't come to this to talk theater. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking up Jefferson Mays. I feel I feel like I should know who he is. So now I do. <laughs> The first uh, actor I ever worked with, the they say that directing is 90% casting. And the first actor I ever cast in a role was Andre Brower. Andre Brower is one of the stars of Brooklyn Nine-Nine and one of the best actors I ever worked with. So I was a great actor from the very beginning, right? Or a great director from the beginning because sure. I cast the best act one of the best actors I ever worked with in my very first play. Other questions? I have one. Um, I was really excited to join this session uh, learning about your background. Um, I have a background in fine arts and you sort of alluded to this, so I might have the answer to my question. Um, but at the beginning of the session, you mentioned um, conversing with the mind and the heart. And one of the questions I had ahead of this session um, and only more so now is, how did you contribute to your co cohort or compliment them having a slightly different background to them? Um, and could you talk to us a little bit about that? Tell me what you mean by my cohort. Tell, uh, tell... Um, so in, so as I understand it, you did your MB, MBA program at UCSD. Um, I, did a, I did an MFA program at UCSD. Oh, MFA. Okay. So yeah. maybe from, oh, maybe from your current role, um, like, is there a way that you, see different backgrounds of people and you also touched on it with the diversity thing but um could you expand on different backgrounds supporting each other from having differences and learning from each other is there anything that you could talk to us about um in that space because i know i'm coming from a probably a different background than a lot of people in the program having a fine arts degree um but i'm very business focused now and so i'm wondering um if you could speak to that at all Danae, it, when I started, when I was studying drama and when I got my degree in directing, I never imagined that I'd be teaching in management schools. Um, and what's interesting for me is I have found that I can integrate all my interests in what I do and they all play together. 
when I began to develop myself as a leader and a teacher of communications and leadership, I became a much, much better director. Um, I found that I was able to gain trust and make people take bigger step, bigger creative steps because I learned about leadership and I learned about how to engage people that way. And likewise, I find at places like Rady, there's a real curiosity from fields for, for, for people that are from fields that are different than where people come from. And I think that where people generally usually come from into a business school. And I think that in this time, one of the hugest issues for us is diversity and is in supporting diversity. And I can only tell you that I think one of the reasons that I'm still, I still feel young and I still feel inspired is I try to learn from everybody. And there's a deep thinking in this, which is that sometimes we think, I teach an idea called, I teach a concept called fierce conversations. And fierce conversations are the difficult conversations. And one of the things that are so important going into a fierce conversation is that you don't assume that you're not going to learn something, that you commit to learning something. And so I love this idea of going into a classroom or going into a difficult conversation and be committed to learning something. And then I also trust other people's motives. I think when I was younger, I thought a lot that like people that were, I thought about sides, do you know, and that there were these divisions were on different sides. But now I try to see like, there's a lot of commonality. And when you think of that relationship, that relationship piece to the opening, I think a lot about like, what are the values that we share? And I and I try to lean in to shared values, even in a place where there are big differences. So today, this is like a topic that I mean, I'd be curious to know your thoughts on it on it also. But um, diversity is really so much at the center of who I am as an artist and a teacher. Very neat to hear. Yeah, I think I, one of the things you said really stood out to me, and that's that trying to learn from someone in a different difficult conversation immediately puts you in a place where you're in this partnership with them instead of like two sides, because you're both, ideally they're hoping to, you know, come to something with you. But if, at least if one party goes in with this idea of learning something, then now you're not so much at odds. Do you know what the most helpful thing is in a difficult conversation that you can do to prep it is make a list of 10 questions that you'd like to ask. So rather than going into a difficult conversation to dictate a solution, I'm thinking about what are the things that if I knew and understood, I could come to a mutual agreement of a solution. So I'm also thinking like, I think about that all the time. Think about it in a networking event. Think about that in your MBA interview. What are the questions? I know that in interviews that I've had at the rep where we're interviewing candidates, one of the first things that we say at the end of the at the at the end of the interview is, well, what questions did they ask? So people are really interested in what you are curious about. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, my email is at the bottom of the form. I'm really happy to be in touch with you. You may think I, I'm like not being serious, but I actually, um, I love coaching uh, any of my Rady students outside of class because I just feel as though these skills that we do in communications have an effect on so many aspects of our life. And if it can help people get stronger in any level of communications, I guess it's something I feel is really valuable. So I invite you to be in touch with me. I hope I can uh, uh, give value for you. Very, very much for everyone and a special thanks to Professor Salovey. Thank you very much. And I look forward to interviewing all of you and I hope to see all these wonderful techniques. I want to answer Piyush's question, which is, how do you look and smile at the camera and look real? Let me give you a <laughs> hack on this, because I think there's actually something which is really helpful. And I'm going to do it right now, which is, you know, those three dots on the right of your picture. If I hide self view, I can engage much more with my camera that our eye on the Zoom screen 
is always drawn to the most charismatic and attractive person on the screen, and it's always ourself. Exactly. <laughs> and if I get myself off of the screen, that I'm much better at engaging my camera. And, and it actually took me a while on Zoom to discover that. But if I take myself out, then I can engage with my camera uh, as if it's one of the people that's in the room.